Welcome to Shannon's Club TV, where we look back on the heritage of cars on Australian roads and racetracks. You can join the conversation with other members on the Shannon's Club website, where you'll also find a huge selection of free motoring content. Coming up, we'll get the latest news from the Shannon's Auctions team and meet a proud owner of our feature car. In today's episode, we take a look at the sporty Italian sedan, the generated performance and polarising opinion in equal measure, the Alfa Romeo 75. Alfa Romeo was one of the last manufacturers to switch from rear wheel drive to front wheel drive for its mainstream models. The Alfa 75, which arrived here in late 1986, was the final descendant of the 1972 Alfetta. The mechanically similar but more conservatively styled 90 sedan had already been on sale for more than a year. Like the Alfetta and Giulietta, the 90 and the 75 had a five-speed rear transaxle and four-wheel disc brakes inboard at the rear. The 90 boasted restrained Bertone styling, while the 75 had been designed in-house by Ermano Cressani. It was an extreme wedge and represented a reimagining of the Giulietta. Alfa Romeo Australia's cunning plan was to sell the 90 to luxury car buyers and position the 75 as a sports sedan. Mark, the 75 was mm. also chosen by Alfa as successor to the GTV6 on the racetrack. Yeah, it was, and that made sense, you know, from a marketing perspective, as you've pointed out, they were positioning it as their sporting sedan. But from an engineering perspective, it made plenty of sense too, because this car shared many of the attributes of the GTV6, but it was going to get the extra grunt of a turbocharged engine, which I'll expand on a bit later on. Both Australian delivered models initially used the charismatic 2.5 litre V6 as seen in the famous GTV6. But the 90 sales potential was cruelled by the lack of an automatic transmission. After three years, the 90 was quietly slipped off the market to be replaced by the front drive 164. By then, the 75 was also offered as a two litre manual four, the novel twin spark unit, a 2.5 litre three speed auto or three litre manual. The four was an updated version of the famous twin cam unit. In my view, the 75's extreme wedge has aged better than Bertone's straight lace 90. And it now seems like an interesting expression of the outlandish 1980s, like a power dressing disco inhabitant. The Alpha 75 can almost be judged a flawed masterpiece. The interior was comfortable with conventional instruments in place of the first 90's garish digital dash. Like the 90, it was a comfortable four, not five seater, with a spacious boot. The twin spark approached the 50-50 weight distribution of the original Alfetta and was the best handling 75. But the very last of the V6 variants known as the Potenziata was the fastest, using the 164's engine with Motronic rather than Bosch Eljetronic injection. These cars are already closely held by our fanatics. Mark, the 75 had some big shoes to mm. fill, didn't it, given the GTV6's global racing success? Yeah, it sure did. But unfortunately, its racing performance didn't match the sum of its parts. On the eve of the first and only World Touring Car Championship in 1987, Alpha's new turbocharged Challenger was expected to be embroiled in a three-way fight with Ford's new Sierra Cosworth RS and BMW's new E30 M3. The decision to base its first turbocharged Group A contender on the 75 sedan seemed a no-brainer. Like its much-loved GTV6 predecessor, the 75 Turbo was blessed with excellent weight distribution and superb handling balance. The race-focused version, of which Alpha had to build 500 road legal examples to qualify, featured major alterations to bodywork, aerodynamics, engine and suspension. The company's competitions department geared up for its global attack with six works or semi-works cars and top driving talent, including numerous Formula One stars. Sadly, the 75 Turbo failed to meet expectations due largely to chronic engine problems. 
Not surprisingly, Alpha promptly pulled out of the WTCC mid-season and cancelled its troubled touring car program. John, the 75 Turbo's failure, you know, that must have been humiliating for a company with you know, such a celebrated competition history as Alfa Romeo. Oh, well, yes. I mean, you say they, they pulled out halfway through the season. Yeah. What, a lot of, what a loss of face that would have been. Absolutely terrible. I mean, I wonder how the dealers would have explained that to customers who Alfa Romeo are a real sporting brand, mm. almost in the sort of way of BMW. Now, you're, yes. a, you're a known Alfa fan. How did that car's failure affect you? Because, I mean, you would have been, you know, you have had high expectations like everyone else well, before the season. I was racing my own Alfa at the time. Yeah. And uh, it was just very awkward. And yeah. I remember Colin Bond saying that, that they promised 300 and something and what they actually had was 200 horsepower. Mm. Yeah, it was pretty bad, wasn't it? Very disappointing, mm. yes. A 75 Turbo also appeared in the 1987 Australian Touring Car Championship. But just like its European stablemates that year, it struggled to be competitive despite the driving talents of Colin Bond and the support of Alfa Romeo Australia and new sponsor Caltex. Race prepared in Europe, the exotic left-hand drive sedan prompted pre-season predictions of stronger results and perhaps even outright wins, given its turbocharged engine offered potentially much higher power outputs than the previous year's GTV6. However, the Italian car was not only haunted by numerous engine failures, but also disappointing lap times, due largely to terrible turbo lag and poor power output. Only about 200 horses when at least 320 were promised. A switch to right-hand drive and engine development by Alpha Racing Specialist Joe Beninka resulted in gradual improvements. But a heavy crash by Bond's co-driver Lucio Cesario at Bathurst required a major repair and a long absence from the track. Fifth place for Bond in its final race at the AGP was fitting reward for a nightmare season. For Bondi, his racing future was in a Ford Sierra. And the 75 Turbo? At best, a promising concept which never realised its potential. Remember, you can read the full road and race histories on the Shannon's Club website. My name is Alan Morrison. Um, and this is my 1987 Alfa Romeo 75 2 litre twin spark. The Italian gentleman who owned the car before I bought it had um, spent quite a lot of money, I believe, repainting it. And mechanically, it was in quite sound condition. Key specifications for this car are 2 litre 8 valve twin cam motor with variable valve timing, which was a new innovation at the time. It has a limited slip differential, which was a factory specification at the time. And it also has inboard rear disc brakes at the back, which were designed to make the unsprung weight at the back less than it would be without forward brakes. I've always been passionate about cars since I was a little kid. And Alfa Romeo was one of the brands that I was particularly interested in because of their rich motorsport history. My favourite memory of the car is taking it out on the track at Phillip Island Grand Prix circuit. Realising a dream to, to go out onto a racetrack in an Alfa Romeo and really enjoy the car to its full potential in that safe environment. The car is very engaging, so much more engaging than a modern car. You really have to concentrate on driving the car well. It's not that it's a difficult car to drive, but to get the best out of it, you have to be willing to put a lot into it. I've been a customer of Shannon's for about 20 years now. I've always liked the fact that they're involved in car scene, they're involved with motorsport, they're involved with car clubs, and I think that's fantastic. My future plans for the car are to put it in the semi-retirement. We've bought another Alpha to use on the track now, so this one's going to have a cushy life inside a comfortable place in the garage. And of course, we'll bring it out and drive it on a nice sunny day like today. Shannon's National Auctions Manager Chris Borobon joins us with the latest market news on the Alfa Romeo 75. Welcome. Hi John. Welcome mate. 
The Alpha 75, I mean, what's the acceptance of this car amongst Alpha fanatics? Because it did have quite yeah. confronting styling, I suppose. Ermano uh, Crisani, yeah. Yeah. The boxy, styling. Boxy car well, even back in the 80s, it, yeah. was, it was confronting and polarising. So yeah. how does it feel today to collect Look, this? I, I think the enthusiasts, the Alpha enthusiasts, embrace the, uh, embrace the car and, uh, you know, the, the a handful of them around today. There's not too many. We, we really don't see many come through the marketplace. But mm. um, you know, really through the club is is really the only place you do see them these mm. days. Okay. Alfa Romeo had a very very confused marketing strategy. They brought out <laughs> these two know. cars that were mechanically virtually identical. The yeah. 90 with yeah. very conservative cyber sides body by Bertoni, mm. and the Ermano Crisani 75 oh. designed in house to be the six. One was meant to replace the Alfetta. Mm. The second was meant to replace the Giulietta. Yep. That's why the 75 has that extreme mm. wedge. Yes. But my own view is that as time's gone past, that's somehow more acceptable than the square yeah. 90. And the 75, you see them getting around the racetracks mm -hmm. still. That's a right, bit. in club racing. Yeah, oh, you probably see 90. more of them in club racing. When was the last time we saw a 90? <laughs> exactly, yeah. that's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that was more in keeping with the real mm. sort of out there kind of alpha feeling. Mm. I and mean, we saw three different engines That's in right, the yeah. 75 sold in Australia. Yeah, two litre twin spark. Two litre twin spark. V6. Yeah, which was out of the GT V6. Yeah. And, and the, the three, three litre V6. Mm. So what's the most desirable yeah. out of those? You'd have to say the two V6s would be the, the, the two most Large capacity. Yeah. 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 And it's still on Alpha's marketing confusion. They tried to position the 90 as a luxury car and the 75 as a sports That's the sporting sedan. one, yeah. So people went in wanting to buy an Alpha. They loved the Alpha 90 and I want an automatic. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, we don't do an automatic. When they yeah. finally did an automatic, it was yeah. in the 75. 75. Yeah. Mm. yeah, it was yeah. quite confusing. And the twin spark two litre four cylinder car, that was that was a bit more competitively priced. And yeah, I think I, it, it I, sold fairly well. And from a handling while. perspective, yeah. I think the better four balanced. cylinder, it's better balanced than the V6. The V6 is a beautiful motor, we yes. all know that. Yeah. But in yeah. terms of that, that incredible front to rear weight distribution we talk That's about right. all these cars. Yeah. It was probably at its best with the four cylinder. Chris, if someone was interested in buying a, an Alpha 75, what do they got to look for? Uh, yeah, like, uh, again, I think with Italian cars like that with the Alpha, you know, it's been well maintained, looked after, serviced correctly by the right people. Mm. Uh, there was some electrical gremlins uh, okay. with, you know, with that model, so, you know, finding something that where all the electrics are working correctly. Okay. Uh, and again, just I think mechanically the car, you know, has been the, the service ensuring history. Ensuring the service history is correct. Yeah. Uh, and again, no body issues, no rust problems, and things like that. Uh, yeah. So I think they're probably the general things to look for. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much indeed, Chris, Chris for joining us today. And remember, you can get all the latest auction results on the Shannon's Club website. For your own race image of the Alpha 75, visit Autopix's incredible motorsport photo archive. John, you know, the 75 wasn't successful on the racetrack, as we know, but its sales in Australia weren't really that strong either, were they? No, they weren't that good. Alfa Romeo's cunning plan, as I said, was to position the 90 as the luxury version and the 75 as the sort of harder-edged, yeah, sporty version one, yeah. with, with a less lavish interior. But mm. the 75 came later, by which time changes in the currency meant that the 75 was actually positioned as a more expensive model then the 90, yeah. very, very confusing. Yeah. And no automatic transmission version for the 90. I think this marketing confusion actually reflected a product planning confusion underneath it. Really, oh, definitely. With those two cars. I also think there was an aesthetic issue in this, regardless of you know, whether you love the wedge styling of the 75 or not, coming you know, after the, the GT V6, this was just so confronting, wasn't it? And whether people were able to accept that, even over time, I, I, it was a bit of a challenge, I think. And quite a paradox that the in-house Emano Crisani car yeah. was a much more radical out there thing than the, than the Carrozzeria, the mm. Bertoni car. Mm. Very, very strange times. Yeah. But interesting. Yeah, interesting, but confused. Yeah. Indeed. Sure. <laughs> Indeed, yes. Well, we hope you've enjoyed looking back on the Alpha 75, and we hope you can join us next time for Shannon's Club TV. Bye for now.